unit six and then Sunday post unit seven. Not on the same day, but you know, alternate days, more like that. Okay. So we had Jai Pataka Swami's Vyasa Puja here today. Yeah, how was it, Maharaj? Well, well, I didn't go myself because I haven't been well. But of course, there's about 15,000 people there. Maharaj, even in Delhi and Mumbai, there's a big celebration everywhere. Yeah, should be. <coughs> yeah, he's done a lot of service for Srila Prabhupada. And of course, he has so many disciples. Yes, Maharaj. I think we are okay to begin now, Maharaj. Okay, thank you. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Jaksur Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhai Evacha Patitanam Pavan Hebyo Vaishnavibhyo namo namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadegor Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So welcome everyone to our study of Bhakti Vai Bhav and we're on the second canto and today we're going to begin chapter 10 entitled Bhagavatam is the answer to all questions. So, in the previous chapter, where we were hearing the, we heard the Chatur Sloki Bhagavatam, of course, spoken by the Lord to Brahma. And then at the end of the chapter, we were hearing about, we were hearing from Sukadeva Goswami. He was describing about how there are ten topics uh, that these four questions, the, the four verses are expanded into ten different topics. And these def ten different topics cover uh, every question which could ever be asked. Whatever question anybody may have in relation to the, the science of God, it's all within the, these ten sub ten categories. So the chapter begins with Sukadeva Goswami listing these ten categ these ten topics. So this is this is an important point. Uh, you may want to memorize these ten topics. Sometimes there's even a book called Dasamula Tattva. And that's describing these ten different topics. Anyway, you can see the ten different topics are listed there in the first text. Sukadeva Goswami is describing them. And just as our first canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, the subtitle, or when you, you know, if you open the cover of the book and look inside the cover of the first canto, you see it's mentioned there, Creation. Swarga. So 
So that's the first topic, first of the ten topics. So twelve cantos, or twelve cantos, and there's a, a title for each of the top, each of the cantos. The tenth canto is what's called the Summon Bonum. The Summon Bonum, the, the ultimate conclusion of everything. And uh, in this way, Srimad Bhagavatam is being described. And this Maha Purana, the greatest Purana, de describing these ten different topics. So the first one is Swarga, and then from Swarga, Visharga, which is the secondary creation. <coughs> and so secondary creation, that's like second canto. And then you hear, then we'll hear about the Stanam. Here, in this, in this, uh, in Prabhupada's word-for-word -word meaning, stanam is, describes the stanam as the planetary systems. I was just looking at Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary, and, and there they describe stanam as being something else. And posanam, protection. Anyway, we thought we'll go with what's here in Prabhupada's books. I'm not a scholar of Sanskrit myself. I've never spent time studying anything. But some of those of you, of course, coming from India and having that culture, it, what does stanam mean to you, Duty Gopi? Mars, stanam means stan, like place. Okay. Oh, like stan, yeah, like a place, uh huh. What was mentioned in Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary about Stanam? I just want, let me remember, I have to look again. Of course, uh, it says that it says Stanam refers to the Lord protecting his devotee. Stanam, mentioned in verse 1, means protection, stiti, which shows the excellence, vijaya, of the Supreme Lord, vaikunthasya, in comparison to Brahma, the creator, and Shiva, the destroyer. Stiti also refers to the condition of the jivas, or Vaikuntha Vijaya can mean the Lord can destroy the suffering of the jiva, since Jai means victory over, like this. And it said that, and then it says, uh, This is the meaning of posanam. Seems quite confusing. And it, maybe I can check with Banu Swami next time I meet him and try to find out what happened, what's going on there. But anyway, let's follow what's in Prabhupada's books. <laughs> One of the problems is editing, sometimes editing. You know, see, Prabhupada did commentaries, 
Prabhupada was mainly doing the commentaries and the word-for-word -word meanings, they were done by Prabhupada's Sanskrit editor. That was usually Prajumna Prabhu. He was called Panditji. And pra Prajumna Prabhu would come with the word-for-word -word meanings or he would do it, the word-for-word -word meanings. And, and Prabhupada would do it, he would do the dictation. He would dictate his commentaries. So, uh, sometimes you can't be sure of everything and the word-for-word -word meanings. Anyway, we'll follow, but we have to go by what's here in the BBT books. I always thought posanam did mean protection. And from what you say, stanam is quite, it's quite reasonable, could be understood as the planetary systems. So it certainly seemed reasonable. I don't know about the other commentary, but I can try to ask Banu Swami about it. And if I find out, find out anything, I could let you know. I can pass it to you and you can put it to the group. I'm sorry I didn't check on this earlier. Mm. Anyway, uh, we've got these different topics, the stanam, poshanam and Uthaya. So you've got, you've got the subplanetary systems, protection by the Lord, and the creative impetus. Uta, Uta, the the creative in, impetus, and then Manvantara, Manvantara, the changes of Manus the histories and the, the changes of the different Manus, particularly we hear about uh, Swayambhuva Manu, that's the, the, the first Manu in this day of Brahma, and then the, the other Manu we hear about is, uh, what was the other, who's the other Manu we generally we hear about? Present Manu is Vaivaswata Manu, And there's also sometimes we hear about uh, Who? The first Manu. Yeah, I said him. I said that. I said Swambhuva Manu. Swambhuva Manu and Vaidhiswata Manu. Chakshush Manu, just before. Chakshusha. Chakshush Manu. Okay. So this, this is, these are three Manus mentioned in present day of Brahma. So he, that's one of the topics which is mentioned. And then Sanu, mm, sa Anukata, the science of God. Ish, isha Anukata, Isha Anukata, the science of God. So of course that's Krishna, that's uh, the pastimes of the Supreme Lord. And then Nirod, Niroda, which is the winding up of the whole creation, Niroda. And it's translated here as going back home, back to Godhead. And then Mukti is one of the ten topics, and Ashraya, the Saman Bonum, the shelter, of ultimate shelter of everything. Right? So you've got Sharga, Visharga, Stanam, Poshanam, Uthaya, Manvantara, anu, anu, Manvantara, Anukata, Niroda, Mukti, and Ashraya. Oh, Manvantara, Ishanukata, Ishanukata, Niroda, Mukti, and Ashraya. So these ten topics you you may want to memorize because they may ask you in your <laughs> closed book test, that kind of thing, these ten topics. So first of all, what is Swarga? The, what is that initial creation? And it is described here for us that uh, 
text number three, we can we hear what is actually Visharga. What is the first one rather? Sarga. The Sharga there. The primary creation is the creation of the elements. And there are 16 different elements mentioned, five different items of matter, or 16 items of matter. You have the five elements, the five basic gross elements, panchabhuti, earth, water, fire, air, ether. And then you have also the five sense objects, sound, form, taste, smell, touch. And then you have the senses, the eyes, ears, nose. Oh, Krishna, what happened? Which text was that on? Text number four. Three, Maharaj. Text three. number three. Oh, thank you. Okay. So, 16 elements are described like that. The five gross elements, the five sense objects, then you have the five knowledge-acquiring senses, along with the mind. And then, in this way, you have 16. So this is called sarga, 16 items of matter. And subsequent resultant interaction of the modes of material nature is called visharga. Visharga, the secondary creation. Sarga is the primary creation. Who is doing that primary creation? Maha Vishnu. Which Vishnu? Mahavishnu. Yes, right, Mahavishnu. And then you've got the secondary creation, the Visharga. Who's doing that? Brahmaji. Right, Brahmaji. Basically, this, this Visharga is the creation of the bodies of the living entities. And then they talk about This uh, stiti, stitir, stiti, meant described as the right situation. We described that stiti, it was mentioned here, stiti is. Oh, it's stanam posanam uthaya. So stiti was referring to the living entity's condition, the living entity itself being in the proper condition. And Sukadeva Goswami describes the proper condition of the living entity is to follow the laws of God, to be prop to follow to be a, an obedient servant and to work under the law's orders. And then we hear about the Manus and their duty is to give laws, just like we have Manu Samita, so the law book for mankind, the Manu Samita. And the Manus were also given, they were also given the knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita. You have the line of disciplic succession. Lord Krishna instructed the Sun God, the Sun God gave it to Manu, Manu gave it to Ikshvaku. And in this way the Rajarshis understood it. So the Manus and their laws are meant to give the right direction the impetus for 
activity is the desire for fruit of work. So the Manus, as leaders of the society, they're meant to create the mood that the living entities will want to work, not that they want everyone to just be idle. The laws are meant to encourage people in their activities. Then Ish, Ish Anu Kata, hearing about the pastimes of the Lord, this is particularly about the, the Lord's incarnations. We have seen this already in the first canto, third chapter, and then we had also in the second canto, seventh chapter, descriptions of the different incarnations of the Lord. So, this is one of the topics of the Srimad Bhagavatam, hearing about the Lord in His different forms and different incarnations. Not only about the Lord, but also about His different devotees. So this is all part of Isha, Ish Anukata, which is one of the ten topics of Srimad Bhagavatam. Then text number six, we have the definition of liberation. Mukti is one of the ten topics, of course, of Srimad Bhagavatam. Mukti and then Saman Bonum. So, Mukti. But before Mukti, then there's Nirod, Niroda, the winding up of the cosmic manifestation. Uh, this takes take, takes place with there's partial devastations. There's a partial devastation at the end of Brahma's day, and then there's another devastation at the end of Brahma's life. In this way, there's some kind of this winding up of the cosmic manifestation. Winding up and again comes creation. Again and again the day comes and the day, again the night falls. And Bhagavad Gita is described in that manner, that creation and destruction are going on continually. Of course, Lord Vishnu is given the, the work of maintain, maintenance, but this Nirod, the winding up of the cosmic manifestation, then this would be done by Lord Shiva. And this definition, the second half of the verse, is a, a line which often quoted by Srila Prabhupada, often quoted by uh, devotees also, muktir hitvanyatarupam svarupena vayavastati. That liberation is the permanent situation of the form of the living entity. After he gives up both his gross and subtle material bodies. In other words, when the living entity comes to the platform of completely pure devotion, when he's finished with karma, he no longer has a body, either gross or subtle, but he's actually achieved his spiritual body, then that is actual liberation. So people often ask us, you know, what is liberation? It can be understood in different ways. Sometimes it means to be free of the modes of material nature, liberation from the gunas. I, I have heard it also explained as liberation means now you're qualified to take up devotional service. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes uh, by engaging in devotional service, you come to the transcendental platform. Mamchayo vayabicharena bhakti yogena sivi sagunam tanak samati chaitam brahma buyai bhayakam. 
that once you take up devotional service, once you're engaged in devotional service without falling down, then you have come to the liberated platform. So real devotional service begins also on the liberated platform. However, here is Sukadeva Goswami's definition of liberation. So if you're asked what is Sukadeva Goswami's definition of liberation, you can state like this. Muktiya hitvanyatarupam swarupena vayavastitihi. It means you've achieved your actual spiritual form. Maybe you're a, maybe you're a cow in the spiritual world. Maybe you're a cowherd boy in the spiritual world. We don't know. But, you know, it, it means somehow you've realized what is your actual swarupa. So that is Sukadeva Goswami's definition of liberation. Hmm. So the first seven verses are describing these different qualities of the, the ten different topics of the of the, the Puranas and particularly of the Srimad Bhagavatam and that one topic is the shelter of all the other nine topics that one shelter that one topic that the summon bonum is the he, that is the shelter the ashraya it's the ashraya of all the other nine. The other nine topics are all based on that. And he is the, the absolute truth. He's the, the supreme, the fountainhead of everything. So that is discussed in chapter, in verse number seven, that Lord Krishna is the shelter of all of these different topics. Are you okay with this? Have I, I don't know if I've explained all of them, these seven topics all right. Do you want to go through them again? We've got Swarga, which is the ten, uh, 16 different elements of the creation. And then, Hare Krishna, yes. Maharaj, we, um, Hare Krishna, thank you. Uh, we are uh, seeing that they have mentioned that 16 items of matter in the elementary creation, but we also saw in that chart when false ego mixes with the mode of passion, uh, this five um, knowledge acquiring senses also and five working senses were also mentioned there. But here only knowledge acquiring senses are mentioned. Yes. So the, these other senses will come later. So, okay. They'll come about later. They're not required in the initial creation. Okay. Okay, Maharaj. And one more question, Maharaj. Um, it is mentioned that Muktir Hitanya Tharupam Sarupena Vivasita. So, uh, if uh, our sarup is fixed, then, but we say that uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come to give us, um, like take us to the highest uh, level of, uh, you know, Gopi Bhav or Madhurya Bhav like that. But let us say once sarup is already a cow or a peacock or something like that. So uh, how can uh, that person be raised to that level of? Well, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has taught everyone that their swarup is Jivar Swarupahai Nitya Krishna Das. That we're all Nitya Krishna Das. That is our swarup. Okay, okay. So, not necessarily that uh, Supreme Mahaprabhu is giving us. Yes. Okay, yes. Thank we're, you. we're not following Siddha Pranali. <laughs> yes, yes, my God. Thank you. Mm-hmm.
Thank you for bringing that up. Hmm. Yes, if you ask somebody like Bhakti Vigyan Goswami, what is your Swarup? He will tell you very clearly. Jivar Swarupahai Nitya Krishna Das. I am the eternal servant of Krishna. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go ahead then. Text number seven. We'll go on to text number eight. We're going to hear about, well, there's some discussion about these three different uh, powers of the Lord, three different personalities they are described, the individual person possessing different instruments of senses. There's the adiatmic person, the adibotic person and the adidaivic person. And we're given definitions of these different people. So, it's not a very important point but it comes here in Srimad Bhagavatam. It's not I just read some of the points which are brought up here in this purport. Said all the senses we have are controlled by the superior demigods, who are also as much living entities as we are. But one is empowered while the other is controlled. The controlled living entity is called the adiatmic person and the controller is called the adidaivic person. All these persons in the material world are due to different fruitive activities. Any individual living being can become the sun god or even Brahma or any other god in the upper planetary system by a higher grade of pious work and similarly one becomes controlled by the higher demigods by lower grades of fruit of activity. So every individual living entity is subject to the supreme control of the Paramatma who puts everyone in different positions of the controller and the controlled. So this is our situation, you know, we're, we're controlled, but sometimes we become controllers. As controllers, of course, our controlling power is limited. We're not the supreme controller, we're tiny controllers. There are many controllers, but there's only one supreme controller. So Prabhupada concludes the purport, he says, uh, it is the Supreme Being who places different parts and parcels in different positions. And thus the conclusion is that the Supreme Person is the shelter of all. All three of the above mentioned stages of different living entities are in interdependent. In the absence of one, another is not understood, but the Supreme Being who sees every one of them as the shelter of the shelter is independent of all and therefore he is the Supreme Shelter. So Sukadeva Goswami is showing, showing the, the difference between the Supreme Lord and the living entities that the Supreme Lord is totally independent. Do you remember in the very beginning of your study of the Srimad Bhagavatam, how was it described, this independence of the Lord? Swarat. Yes. Abhigyana Swarat, right? Fully cognizant and fully independent. We, we have some cognizance, we have some independence, but we're not totally. So this is the, the difference between the Lord and the living entities. 
So he's the ultimate shelter, and we're not. Going ahead, text number 10. After separating the different universes, the gigantic universal form of the Lord, Mahavishnu, which came out of the causal ocean, the place of appearance for the first Purusha avatar, entered into each of the separate universes, desiring to lie on the created transcendental water, the Garbhodak. So you can see Sukadeva Goswami is going on to explain about how the Lord, from the, from, from the universal form, He actually creates the different universes, and uh, the, uh, the different living entities, different, different universes, yeah. It's going to be described. This was something which Maharaj Pariksit wanted to understand. It mentioned in the purport, in order, oh, what, what, I'll, I'll read a bit earlier, the Supreme Lord Krishna and all his plenary portions and expansions of plenary portions are non-different from one another. And thus the supreme independence is in each and every one of them. In order to prove this, Sukadev Goswami, as promised to Maharaj Pariksit, describes herein the independence of the Purusha avatar, personality of Godhead, even in the sphere of the material creation. The activities of the Lord are also transcendental, and therefore they are also lila, or pastimes of the Absolute Lord. Such pastimes of the Lord are very conducive to the hearers for self-realization in the field of devotional service. Some may argue, then why not relish the transcendental lila of the Lord as exhibited in the land of Mathura and Vrindavan, which are sweeter than anything in the world? So this is something which our minds would often bring up in studying things like Srishti Tattva, hearing about the creation and the, the universal form again, and oh my goodness, we have to go through all this again. This is the nature of, why don't we just hear the Leela? Well, I just want to hear about the Lord's pastimes, the Mathura, they're very sweet, they're sweeter than anything else. So Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur replies that the pastimes of the Lord in Vrindavan are meant to be relished by advanced devotees of the Lord. Neophyte devotees will misunderstand such supreme transcendental activities of the Lord. And therefore the Lord's pastimes in the material sphere related to creation maintenance and destruction are verily relishable by the prakrita or mundane devotees of the Lord. As the yoga system mainly based on bodily exercises is meant for the person who is too much attached to the bodily conception of existence, similarly the Lord's pastimes related to the creation and destruction of the material world are for those who are too materially attached. For such mundane creatures the functions of the body and the functions of the cosmic world through physical laws in relationship to the Lord are also uh, therefore included in understanding of the lawmaker, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In, in another place, I also remember hearing the examples given that uh, just like 
a person burned by fire, he can often get relief from the pain of being burned by fire by another fire. That the fire itself gives relief from the pain which he's feeling due, due to the due to the, the initial burn. So in the same way, hearing about Maya sometimes, you know, after we've experienced the the, 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 the misery of Maya and the suffering which is there in the material world. And if we hear about Maya again, then it's actually very good for us to appreciate more the nature of the material energy. And so this, this point is made in several, these points are brought up several times in Prabhupada's commentary, encouraging us that we need to hear these things, we need to develop the appreciation for the Lord's pastimes, not only in the groves of Vrindavan, but also in the work of the manifestation of the material universes. We don't see the Lord just simply as a creator, however, but it is one of the aspects as the Supreme Lord, that he does, he has that duty. So we hear about how the Lord is laying on the water. We heard Mahavishnu at the beginning of the creation is laying on the water and then he expands himself into each universe as Garbhodakashayi Vishnu. And here it's mentioned, the transcendental water created from the Supreme Nara is known as Nara. And because he lies down, he is known as Narayana. And then we're told about the supreme, the supreme position of the Lord. All material ingredients and the living entities, they're all, uh, all meant to enjoy, to be enjoyed by the Lord and to exist only by His mercy. And as soon as, he's, as he doesn't take any care, for, any interest for them, then everything becomes non-existent. So everything is there for the pleasure of the Lord in the whole creation. And that, that includes the living entities. As Prabhupada notes in the purport, text number 12, the living entities are therefore totally dependent on the mercy of the Lord. So he's going to, Sukadeva Goswami is going to explain to us how the Lord manifests the form within the universe, from the universal form. We see text 13, a description about the Lord's manifesting varieties of living entities from himself. Different forms are coming out. Prabhupada writes, as such, before the creation or manifestation of the material cosmic world, the Lord exists as total energy, Maha Samasti, and thus desiring himself to be diffused to many, he expands himself further into multi-total energy. From the multi-total energy, he further expands himself into individuals in three dimensions, namely Adiatmic, Adidaivic, and Adibotic as explained before. 
So in this way we're hearing how the creation comes about. Of course, those who are liberated souls, they don't have to come into this material world. And then Sukadeva Goswami says, now hear from me how the living, how the controlling entities in the material bodies are created. The text 15 begins that description. And we hear the, about the, first of all, the gross material body is created from the sky, situated within the body of the manifestation Mahavishnu, you have sense energy, mental force and bodily strength are all generated as well as the sum total of the fountain head force. Yes. May I ask a question now? Yeah, please. Well, oh. as this point came that uh, this creation and destruction pastime are especially meant for those who are too materially attached. We see sometimes that uh, Bhagavatam, there are different topics. Some topics are very interesting like stories relishable, but sometimes they thought devotee that second canto is not, you know, that relishable. Uh, there are a little difficult to understand, the creation aspects are given, so sometimes it is skipped like that. Uh, and so here from you about that, from this point. Thank you. Yes, I know. It's, it's certainly a challenge to go through the second canto. It's a lot of philosophy and it's not the lightest philosophy. It, it's, it's quite heavy. Yes, it, it is. As I told you, Jayadweda Swami had told, I'd heard Jayadweda Swami talking about, he said he wanted to do some editing work on that second canto, make it easier, but Prabhupada told him, said, no, no, just leave it as it is. He said, don't try to edit it. Anyway, it's uh, Prabhupada's purports, Prabhupada's purports are his ecstasies, and we should understand. I remember, actually, the second canto came out when I was, I just joined the movement Prabhupada had gone to America with the first canto printed in India. The second canto he started printing in the USA and he printed one chapter at a time. So we got one chapter at a time. There was one chapter being printed like that. The whole second canto came out one chapter at a time. Separate publications. So it was a bit it was a bit difficult also if you get one chapter, you know, to put the whole thing together, it's not easy. But if when you go through it systematically, you hear the second canto from the beginning, you have the appearance of Sukadeva Goswami, and you have Maharaj Parikshit uh, approaching Sukadeva Goswami and being encouraged by him. And then you hear the questions of Maharaj Parikshit and how Sukadeva Goswami responds to them and how he explains different incidents in history where the similar questions had been asked before. So it, it, it takes some time to put the whole thing together. But if you're patient and if you work on it systematically, then gradually you can actually put, the, put it together and and 
get to understand everything, it, it becomes very relishable. But it does take that meditation, that absorption. You have to be willing to really focus your mind on it, to hear. The mind itself is resisting. It's not something which we take, which we can just hear so easily and uh, immediately absorb. It's, we could call it dry philosophy. But that philosophy can become also liberating and purifying. We have to hear it again and again. It's, it's just like the holy name, chanting Hare Krishna mantra. People may say, oh, you know, it's the same thing you chant every day. Don't we chant, can't we chant anything else? <laughs> so it does take some time to endeavor to put this whole philosophy together to understand what's going on. But if you want to actually appreciate the later levels of the Srimad Bhagavatam, then it's very important for us to work on this second canto. It is the Pada Padma, it is the lotus feet of Krishna. So if we hear it carefully and assimilate the knowledge properly, then it can be very purifying for us and it will certainly help us to go through the whole Srimad Bhagavatam to make a success of this study. Maharaj, thank you Maharaj for explaining and you as you are explaining so it is becoming uh, easier to understand it and uh, link by link. Uh, so I was uh, just uh, clarifying that the purpose of this second canto is like to show how the how great the creation of the Lord is and thereby develop our attraction to the creator like the Lord so that we can appreciate his activities in the further cantos. Is it fine? Yes. Very nice. Definitely. We want to appreciate the lotus feet before we go above. If we don't, if we're not attracted by the lotus feet, you think you can, you have any right to look on the face of the Lord? You have no attraction for his lotus feet? And you're just going to look on the Lord's face? No. So we have to be realistic and we have to follow the process. And Prabhupada also mentioned that the first two cantos are they're necessary for us to get actually free of the mundane conception of life so that we can go on to the higher subject matter of Bhagavad philosophy. And just think how much effort Srila Prabhupada, how much time Prabhupada put into going through each of these verses very systematically, presenting. You know, I mean, he could have thought, oh, this is just second canto, oh, these purports, you know, oh, nobody will read them, why should I bother? But we can see Prabhupada writes elaborate purports on these points bringing out these things. And so we, we have to appreciate the, how much meditation there is. As Prabhupada was absorbed in writing, we also want to become absorbed in reading and hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam from him. And this is what will bring us out of this material conception of life. This Bhagavatam, this is the light, right? This is the, 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 where in the disappearance of Lord Krishna, the Srimad Bhagavatam has come. So we take shelter of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Not just simply Rasa Leela, but we have to hear it carefully. And first canto, second canto, very, very, very important for us. 
to get everything in the right perspective. And with a good appreciation of what's happening, what's going on here, when we go on to the later cantos, then it will all fit together. All right, text number 17. The living force being agitated by the Virat Purush generated hunger and thirst, and when he desired to drink and eat, the mouth opened. So here you have the creation of the mouth. The living force was agitated by the Virat Purush. Prabhupada writes, the desires for all kinds of sense perception and sense organs exist in the Supreme. And thus they take place in the individual persons. This desire is the nature of the Supreme Living Entity, the Absolute Truth, because He is the sum total of all, all mouths, the individual living entities, have mouths. Similarly, with all other senses and sense organs. The, here, the mouth is the symbolic representation of all sense organs for the same principles apply to the others also. So we hear about the, this, the creation, it's coming on it's going to be described one after, one after another with the creation of the mouth and then text 18 describes then the tongue, we need a tongue which can relish it, we need a palate and the tongue was generated and with the tongue then you can taste different things. Prabhupada explains the tongue and the palate being instrumental at adibutum or forms of matter, but the functioning deity who is a living entity is adidaivik, whereas the person undergoing the function is adiyatma. Thus the three creations are also explained as to their birth after the opening of the mouth of the Virata Paru. The four principles mentioned in this verse serve to explain the three main principles namely Adiatmic, Adidaivic and Adibotic, as explained before. So the tongue was created and then fire is generated from the mouth. Laying in the water, all these functions remain suspended. When the Supreme desired to speak, speeches were vibrated from the mouth. Right. Speaking come from the mouth. It didn't come from the ear. It didn't come from the legs. It came from the mouth. And then, next to be created, desire to smell. So you have the creation of the nose. Not Which text were we on? 20. Okay. So the creation of the nose. And Prabhupada writes, the idea is that the living entity cannot do anything independently. He can simply think of doing something independently, but he cannot act independently. The whole explanation is on the subject of the absolute dependence of the living entities and absolute independence of the Supreme Lord. So this is the contrast between us and the Lord. Have a break. Have a five minute break. Hare Krishna.
All right, so we're hearing about the creation from the universal form, how the universe has come into existence. We're hearing first about here, in, in this particular section, we've been hearing about the creation of the different uh, senses. That first of all, different <coughs> sense objects desired to be utilized, it mentions, like text 20, the Supreme Purusha desired to smell odors. So the nostrils, respiration were generated, the nasal instrument and odors came into existence, and the controlling deity of air carrying smell also became manifest. So all of these things came about at the same time. They all came about together by the will of the Supreme Purusha. The Supreme Purusha, meaning the one Supreme Lord who creates everything. And then 21 is describing about sight and the power of vision. And so in order for that, we need eyes, but not only eyes. You may have eyes, you may not be able to see anything. So we need also sun. And it's not just only sun on its own, but with, the, with our eyes, with the help of sunlight, we're able to see things. And so this is all that the desire of the Lord, that we should be able to appreciate the different objects of the material world. Then text 22 describes about the great sages who desired to know. So in order to, to know things, we have to hear. And so to, we have ears and the power of hearing, and then there's a controlling deity of hearing, and the objects of hearing, they all became manifest. And great sages wanted to hear about the self. There was one devotee in Srila Prabhupada's time, he was speaking, and Prabhupada said he had the full blessings of Brihaspati. He said he had the full blessings of Brihaspati. His speaking was so captivating and charming and powerful. So Prabhupada said like that, he said he's blessed by Brihaspati. So there's the deity behind speech, also hearing. Yeah, there, you know, we, when we want to hear, some people, they're, they're present, we don't hear anything, we don't remember anything. So you need to also have the blessings, not just only having ears, it's not just only having ears and being present, but it's that eagerness to hear. That is important and a very important quality. The power that we should be willing to, we want to hear, we want to inquire. We want qualified speakers and the qualified speaker, he wants a qualified audience. 
Sometimes you have a, a, you have a great speaker and you have a terrible audience. And sometimes you have a good audience and the speaker's no good. So it's, the balance is there. You see, perfect balance is there. Sukadeva Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit. And Sukadeva Goswami is so eager to speak and Maharaj Parikshit is eager to hear. So then 23 goes on to describe about the skin and then the controlling deities and all of these different aspects of the, what can the skin do. The, the skin can perceive heat and cold and the skin can perceive the, uh, on, on the skin there will be pores and there will be hairs growing from the body of the skin. So all of these things are generated. This is text 23. Prabhupada writes, There is, however, an intimate relationship between the hairs on the body and the vegetation on the body of the earth. The vegetables are nourishment for the skin, both as food and medicine, as stated in the third canto. In the third canto, that's in, uh, in the teachings of Lord Kapila, particularly describes there about the vegetables and how uh, in the universal form they're described as the hair growing on the body of the Lord. So vegetables, of course, are very important for good skin. It's, it's a valuable medicine, nutrition. But it's also important that the vegetables, are, are, that they can grow naturally. Some, nowadays they, they try to do so many terrible things. They won't give them the vegetables proper light. They're not given proper light and they're not even given the opportunity of proper soil. They get very little soil and it's a very mechanized, uh, impersonal manner in which they grow vegetables today. But when everything is done in a personal way, you can see much more reciprocation. Just like taking care of cows. When you do it personally, when you take care of, when you treat the cows as person, as, with, with friendship and personality, then the, the, the cows, they can appreciate and they will reciprocate and give more milk. And similarly, vegetables and crops, they will flourish where they're given proper treatment and proper care. They're grown and put in good soil. The soil should be nice. There should be proper ir irrigation. There should be nice sunlight. And then you can produce nice crops. Now everything is done with chemicals and, and it's all done in a nasty manner. So then text 24 describes about hands. Certainly you, would, you need hands to work. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, in this uh, text 23, Prabhupada writes, knowledge of the self can expand to the knowledge of phenomena, but physical knowledge cannot lead to knowledge of the self. Yes. Maharaj, can you explain this line? Knowledge of the self can expand to the knowledge of phenomena. Knowledge of the self, meaning understanding our spiritual nature, will expand to the knowledge of phenomena. Knowledge of phenomena, the phenomena. But physical knowledge cannot lead to knowledge of... <laughs> yeah, well, in other words, you can't go back the way. Physical, it's not that by knowledge of phenomena you can come to no knowledge of the self. You... Physical knowledge, just simply dry physical knowledge, doesn't mean you've understood the self. So Prabhupada's just reversing it around. He's saying that physical knowledge cannot lead to knowledge of the self. 
You may know everything about the material world, but you don't know anything about your spiritual identity. But if you have proper ed spiritual education, you understand who you are as a spiritual being, then you can go on to understand phenomena. Phenomena meaning the experiences of the material world. Just like you become att attracted to things, you become attracted to a, a man, or, or you become attracted to children, you become attracted to money. You, these are different phenomena. Phenomena is also the phenomena of growing old in the material world, and the phenomena of disease. These different things are understood when we have proper knowledge of the Self. Without proper knowledge of the Self, we will be bewildered by these things. But for a person who is in knowledge of his spiritual identity, he is not bewildered. So physical knowledge is just simply knowledge you may get from a teacher in the classroom. They simply give you information. You read the textbook, you get information. You may have so much knowledge, information, but you have no knowledge of the Self. Do you understand? Yes, Manal, thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Okay, then text 24 describes the living entity is controlled by the senses. The senses are controlled by the demigods, and the demigods are the servants of the Supreme Lord. As long as the living entity continues to be puffed up by his tiny existence, he is to be understood to be under the stringent laws of the external energy, and there is no question of liberation for, from the clutches of illusion, however much one may declare himself a liberated soul. <laughs> <coughs> then text 25 describes about legs and the controlling deity of legs, Vishnu. And Prabhupada explains, he said, legs are probably the most important. The legs, it's a very, very important for us, our legs. And, uh, and Prabhupada writes about it, he said, uh, where was it I was reading? Uh, for performing such occupational duties of life, the leg is the most important instrument of the body. Because without the help of the legs, one cannot move from one place to another. And therefore the Lord, the Lord has special control over the legs of all human beings, which are meant for performing yajyas. So yajna means sankirtan. Kali Yuga Dharma Harinam sankirtan. So legs are meant for? Chanting and dancing. And then text 26 goes on to describe about sexual pleasure. And the Lord also desires sexual pleasure. The Lord takes pleasure in this thing. The object of sexual pleasure and controlling deity are under the control of the genitals of the Lord. This material world is created to give the conditioned souls a chance for rejuvenation, for going back home, back to Godhead. And therefore, generation of the living being is necessary for upkeep of the purpose of creation. We like children. We're not against children. We love children. Sometimes people think, oh no, children, oh no, don't bring any children. No, we love children. We want children. Prabhupada writes, one can beget hundreds of children 
and enjoy the celestial pleasure of sexual intercourse, provided he is able to train the children in God consciousness. What did Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati say about it? Someone? If Bhakti I could make all my children Krishna conscious, I would have hundreds of. Yes, he said, I would have married hundreds of wives if I thought I could have had a Krishna conscious child. So one should always remember that the genital sexual pleasure, the woman and the offspring are all related in the service of the Lord. And one who forgets this, this relationship in the service of the Lord becomes subject to the threefold miseries of material existence by the laws of nature. All right. And then text 27 describes about evacuation. You have to be able to evacuate. And there's a controlling deity, Mitra. So there's the, the sensory organ, the evacuating substance, born under the shelter of the controlling deity. So this is also under the control of the demigods, and the demigods are under the control of the Lord. And then we d desires to move from one body to another, text 28, we read about the navel and the air of departure and death. They were all combinedly created. So death and the separating force. So giving up one body, this is also under the control. It's mentioned there's pranavayu and apanavayu. Pranavayu continues the life and apanavayu stops the life. The end of the life. So death is the change of body. Then there was a desire to have food and drink, the abdomen and the intestines and also the arteries be became manifested. The rivers and seas are the source of their sustenance and metabolism. So we can see how everything in the world, everything in our body is all related to the universal form. Therefore, the bodily health is dependent on healthy conditions, healthy actions of the intestines and the arteries. The rivers and the seas, being the controlling deities of the two, keep the intestines and the arteries in healthy order. Then there was a desire to think about the activities of his own energy. All desires became manifest. So this is subtle. We're hearing about the subtle activity. And the deity of the mind is? Who's the oh. deity? The moon, right? Chandra. Worship the moon. Some, I remember in New, in New York, on the full moon night, we'd hope there would always be so many crazy people, they'd come banging on the doors of our temple. Somehow it seemed to really disturb people on the full moon night, they'd just go crazy. Prabhupada writes, the material mind of the living entity develops when the super soul sits on his heart, after which the mind the controlling deity, the moon, and the activities of the mind, thinking, feeling and willing, all take place. The activities of the mind cannot begin without the manifestation of the heart. And the heart becomes manifest when the Lord wants to see the activities of the material creation. 